Today, the nasty cocktail and who's drinking. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the Property Imperative Weekly to the 16th of June 2018, our digest of the latest finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. We start with the international market because familiar market foes returned this week as the US and China vowed to move ahead with trade tariffs. China ignored US President Donald Trump's threat of further tariffs in the event of retaliation, vowing to immediately impose penalties of the same scale on American goods, raising the prospect of a tit-for-tat trade war between the world's two largest economies. The Fed hike on Wednesday was accompanied by a more hawkish outlook on rate hikes. The US Central Bank hinted at the prospect of two additional rate hikes this year, taking the expected total rate hikes for 2018 to four from three previously. The odds of a fourth rate hike at the Fed's December meeting has soared to 51.1% from 33.8% the previous week. While the prospect of a faster pace of US monetary policy tightening also weighed on sentiment, That didn't stop US stocks from notching up a third straight weekly win as a rally in tech and media stocks underpinned investor demand. The VIX, the volatility index, which signals the relative uncertainty in the market was down again from its peak a few weeks ago. The US District Court ruled in favour of the AT&T and Time Warner merger earlier this week sparking a wave of action in media stocks. And a day after the ruling, Comcast launched a $65 billion bid for 20th Century Fox assets that Walt Disney had already struck a deal to buy, setting the stage for perhaps an intense bidding war. The S&P 500 posted a weekly win, despite closing 0.25% lower on Friday at 2,781.50, reacting to the escalating trade wars. Crude oil prices settled sharply lower on Friday on concerns that OPEC would lift limits on production restrictions, paving the way for an uptick in global output, threatening the pace of rebalancing in oil markets. Investor fears that OPEC and its allies would hike output at its June 22 meeting came to the fore this week amid remarks from both Russia's and Saudi Arabia's energy ministers. Both agreed to gradually increase production. Crude futures settled 2.74% lower on Friday as data showed that US oil rigs continued to climb. The US dollar closed at a year-to-date high against its rivals despite a modest setback on Friday as a sharp tumble in the euro earlier this week encouraged traders to pile into the greenback. The euro suffered its worst daily loss in two years on Thursday, after the European Central Bank said that it would leave interest rates unchanged until the summer of 2019, although they will taper down QE through this year. That came a day after the Federal Reserve had signalled a faster pace of rate hikes for this year and the next, further encouraging investor appetite for the greenback. The dollar fell 0.16% to 94.79 against a basket of major currencies on Friday. The Aussie dollar slipped against the US dollar, which signals a risk of importing inflation into Australia and more risks to the local economy. Gold prices fell to 2018 lows on Friday, as traders appeared to unwind their holdings of gold despite the growing prospect of a trade war between the US and China. That, however, failed to lift demand for safe haven gold amid expectations the dollar will continue its upside momentum. And cryptocurrencies slid this week, wiping more than 60 billion US dollars from the market as Bitcoin fell to a near four-month low, 
before staging a very timid rebound. Bitcoin started the week on the back foot after South Korean crypto exchange CoinRail confirmed in a tweet that cyber thieves had made off with over $30 million worth of lesser known cryptocurrencies following a successful cyber attack. That proved to be touch paper for further sell-offs as the popular crypto fell close to a four-month low of $6,125, rattling traders' appetite to hold cryptos as billions of dollars were pulled from the market. The total crypto market cap fell to about $282 billion from around $342 billion a week ago. And over the past seven days, Bitcoin fell 18.67%, Ethereum fell 14%, while Ripple XRP fell 19.29%. So more evidence, if you needed it, that crypto is not a stable currency alternative. But risks lurk in the dark corners, according to Fitch Ratings. Global trade tensions have risen significantly this year, but at this stage, they say, the scale of the tariffs imposed remains too small to materially affect the global growth outlook. A major escalation that entailed blanket across-the-board geographic tariffs on all trade flows between several major countries would be much more damaging. In addition, populist political forces continue to create policy risk and increase the threat of rising tensions within the Eurozone that could adversely impact the outlook for investment, a key driver of growth last year. Fitch made only a modest downward revision to their Eurozone investment forecasts this year to 3.3% from 3.9% in March. But a further escalation in uncertainty represents an important downside risk. But a much sharper than anticipated pickup in US inflation remains a key risk to the global outlook, they said. The decline in US unemployment to 3.8% in May is becoming more important to watch, and they forecast the rate to hit a 66 year low of 3.4% in 2019. A wide array of indicators of US labour market tightness suggests it is now only a matter of time before sharper upward pressure on US wage growth starts to be seen. They said that an inflation shock in the US could bring forward adjustments in US and global bond yields and sharply increase volatility, harming risk appetite. In particular, it could lead to a rapid decompression of the term premium, which remains negative for US 10-year bond yields. In combination with a likely aggressive Fed response, this would be disruptive for global growth. Indeed, the synchronised global economic growth that began in 2018 appears to be running its course, according to NAB. Synchronised global growth was a favoured expression by economists and research houses at the end of last year, with each of the 45 major economies tracking growth upwards. But according to the latest economic summary by NAB, this global growth rate may have reached its peak. Growth in the major economies was 2.2% year on year in the first quarter of 2018, a small drop from the 2.4% in the last quarter of 2017. Although this slowdown was modest, it points to a divergence in conditions across countries, which over recent years has displayed relatively synchronized growth. In addition, many short and long-term interest rates have started to increase or will do so over the forecast period, they say. Turning to the local scene, Moody's confirmed Australia's rating of AAA, which puts us in an exclusive club alongside the United States, Switzerland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Netherlands and New Zealand. They just reviewed the rating. Some other agencies still have a negative watch on Australia, as they are more concerned about the outlook, given our exposure to foreign trade and debt. But Moody's concluded that thanks to good GDP numbers, relatively low on an international basis government debt, at only 42% of GDP, although up from 26.5% five years ago, 
and our strong institutions, including RBA and APRA, the rating is confirmed. The bonus income from higher resource prices also helped. They did highlight some concerns about the government needing to control spending in order to bring the budget back to balance as forecast against a fraught political background and also the risks from high levels of household debt in a flat wage environment. They suggest that household income growth will be slower than government forecasts, but they are still looking for GDP growth around 2.75%. They also suggest that government spending will remain under pressure, given the expected 6% rise in social welfare programmes, including health and NDIS. In terms of risks, they see two. First, is rising household debt, which they say exposes the economy and government finances. And second is Australia's reliance on overseas funding, which may be impacted by changes in international investor sentiment. Rate rises abroad might lift the cost of government and bank borrowing, adding extra pressure on the economy. But their judgment is that these risks are not sufficient to dent the prized AAA rating. So that's okay then, it, except that S&P Global Ratings, our MBS Performance Watch to the 31st of March 2018, said that the prime 30-day spin was now 1.37% in the quarter one 2018, up from 1.07% on the previous quarter. They said that loans more than 90 days in arrears were at historically high levels at the end of Q1, indicating that mortgage stress has increased for some borrowers. Western Australia, again, recorded the nation's highest arrears at 2.71%. Arrears rose during Q1 in most parts of the country, and they warned of the consequences of higher interest rates ahead. You can grab our separate post what the rating agencies are saying for more details. Our latest Household Finance Security Index showed a further fall, dropping to 90.2, down from 91.7 last month. This is below the neutral setting of 100. Property-related sentiment is hitting hard, especially in New South Wales and Victoria, where price falls are most evident. The budget pressure on younger households remains severe, especially those paying rent or mortgages. Those entering the retirement phase, 60 plus years, continue to wrestle with outstanding mortgages. Many more now hold loans into retirement and also experience lower returns from deposits. You can get the full results in our post household financial security tanks in May as property falls hit home. It's worth putting this alongside the RBA comments this week on wages growth which suggests that any lift from the current anemic levels will be slow. And real debt burdens will stay higher for longer in this scenario. Many people who borrowed expecting their incomes to grow at something like the old rate rather than the current rate. With their expectations not being realised, the real value of the debt stays higher than they expected. And this is likely to affect their spending decisions. And beyond these purely economic effects, the slow wages growth is also diminishing our sense of shared prosperity. If this remains the case, it can make needed economic reforms more difficult. Oh, and the employment data out this week superficially looked OK, with an increase in the total number of jobs and a fall in the seasonally adjusted rate of employment from 5.6% last month to 5.4% in May. But in fact, we think this is another soft result thanks to a slide in the number of hours worked, anemic and falling jobs growth, a further shift to part-time employment and a rise in underemployment. The monthly trend unemployment rate remains steady at 5.5%, well above the 5% level at which wages rises may kick in, according to the bank. See more at our post, Unemployment Signals More Trouble Ahead. The trend participation rate decreased by less than 0.1% to 65.5% in May. The auction results last week were down again, but hardly worth a mention given the long weekend in many states. But the trend of slowing property continues to bite harder. 
CoreLogic once again has been looking at where prices are falling. They say that across the combined capital cities, dwelling values have fallen 1.1% over the past 12 months. But looking at the first decile, values have increased by 1.3% over the past year, whilst across the 10th decile, the most expensive, values have fallen by 5.7%. Of note is that when values fall, declines across the most affordable properties have been significantly smaller than the declines across the most expensive properties. And the opposite is generally the case during the growth phase, where the most expensive properties have generally outperformed the broader market. Sydney has seen the largest declines of all capital cities over the past year, with values down 4.2%. Across the first decile, values are 1% higher, while the 10th decile has recorded value falls of 7.3%. Over the past year, Melbourne dwelling values have increased by 2.2%, with the first decile recording an increase of over 10%, whilst the 10th decile has seen a value falling by about 3.5%. This makes it clear that you need to get granular across the property market, something which we discussed in our interview with buyer's agent Chris Curtis last week. The full interview, Property Dispatches from the Front Line, is still available, and I recommend it. This post hit top spot on both our blog and YouTube sites. It seems that first-time buyers are helping to support the market, although the latest figures show that the total number of first-time buyer loans in May fell by 8%. Indeed, overall lending growth is slowing, as the ABS data this week showed. They confirm the macro trends we've already reported. Lending volume flows are solidly down, and the trend suggests more in the months ahead. We're entering a new phase in the credit cycle, and this will put further pressure on home prices. You can get more from our post, yet more evidence of the property slowdown. Finally, as the AFR pointed out, the banks are under intense margin pressure now, as they are being squeezed by higher borrowing costs as the US Federal Reserve accelerates its interest rate hikes and drains liquidity from global financial markets, while the Hain Royal Commission makes it difficult for them to raise home loan rates. They said that analysts estimate that the spreads paid by Australian banks have climbed by close to 40 basis points since the beginning of the year, which has swollen the wholesale borrowing costs of the country's banks by some $4.4 billion a year. They quoted AMP's Head of Investment Strategy, Shane Oliver, who said that the blowout in the BBSW could reflect Australian borrowers rushing to lock in funding before the end of the financial year for fear that the borrowing situation could worsen. Dr Oliver said that the banks were likely to be absorbing the higher funding costs in their margins, but he warned that the risk is that they will start to increase some mortgage rates. But we think something else is going on because the spreads in Australia are a lot bigger than those in other markets. And we suspect it's a lack of confidence in our local banks, thanks to the revelations from the Royal Commission. A quick look at the recent share prices of, for example, Westpac, the largest investment home loan lender, and CBA, the largest owner-occupied home loan lender, tells the story. The markets are nervous. The pincer movements of higher funding, less confidence and a slowing and more risky housing market are all adding to the bank's woes. They are stuck because any lift in mortgage rates will drive prices lower and lift defaults from over-leveraged households. Actually, this is the reason why we think the RBA may be forced to cut the cash rate ahead. A nasty cocktail. If you like what you've seen here today, please like the post and add a comment or a question. I read them all. And if you want to join the growing band of subscribers who receive alerts when we release new posts, do subscribe. And if you've already subscribed, many thanks. I really appreciate your support and participation. I'm Martin North, the Principal Analyst at Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.